Choice program. So I met some of you in jam when I was a Jammies judge, uh, but some of you, this is the first time I've met you, so nice to meet you. Welcome. I'll probably see you in the Pathway Center and at all of the events we have throughout the year for the first year of Pathways. So we're going to go ahead and get started with our feature presentation today, which is with Ayana A. H. Jameson, who is a writer, educator, and organizer. And she is the founder of the Los Angeles-based Octavia E. Butler Legacy Network, which is a community organization that highlights the ongoing creative, scholarly, community, and social justice work inspired by Octavia E. Butler. So let's welcome our guest speaker. Hi, so I just want to make a quick housekeeping um, thing. Professor Rose also asked you, if you, are, uh, if you have empty seats near you, please uh, fill in the center and let people who walk in late sit in those edge seats because those folks might be coming from class or from Rosemead and we don't want them to have to step over you. Like over here, um, if you guys just fill in the empty seats in case somebody needs to come and sit down. That way they can uh, just come in and get integrated into what we're doing. So, I, uh, this is tricky because I'm doing three different talks and they're all going to be a little bit different. So I'm going to review some of the information that I went over the first time because I think it's valuable for students. I am teaching a section of College One. My class meets Monday, Wednesday from like 12.15 to 1.40. And so we're all reading the book and I know that not everyone has finished the whole text. And I try to be a spoiler-free speaker. I hate when you like go on Facebook and someone says, someone died on This Is Us or whatever. And you're like, oh, I haven't watched it. So it's very upsetting. So I try not to do that. So this is a talk through. It's kind of like a verbal walk through. Um, my, um, my expertise and training um, have brought me to this point. So as I share things about my expertise and training, you'll see how I read Octavia Butler and it influences how I teach it and how I speak about it. I've, I've done many different kinds of talks. Um, and so I'm happy to be here and um, thank you for coming. So here's a little bit about Octavia Butler. She was born in 1947 in Pasadena, California in what she called Jim Crow, California. This meant that even though Jim Crow laws were not on the books per se, uh, as Jim Crow, she very much felt the sting of segregation um, in California. Her mother was a maid um, and they often uh, were in places where uh, people of color were not welcome um, or allowed. Um, she wrote about a dozen books um, that are published, but there are also several unpublished manuscripts in the archives, short stories, essays, newspaper articles, and she gave many, many speeches. And her speeches are often a source of information for me because when she as she aged and progressed in her career, she would look back on earlier texts. Dawn was written right in the middle of her career. So at the end of that slide, it said that she attended PCC for three years. Um, it took her three years to finish her associate's degree. I believe it was in history. Um, and she transferred with enough credits that she could have had a minor in something else. She worked her way through school, like many of you. She had lots of uh, interesting jobs. Many of them were not jobs that anyone would want, like a potato chip sorter or um, foam inspector. She worked at a retail store, so customer service. She sold things on the telephone, like vacuum cleaners or something. So like terrible jobs that no one would want to have, but she had them because she knew that she, she wanted to write. So she would wake up at three or four in the morning, write until six or seven, go to work for eight hours, go to class, uh, go home and go to sleep and wake up and do it all over again. And she would, uh, work bef uh, she would work full time and go to school as much as she could and she would write in all the times in between and study and study and study and research and research and research. How many people have started to research already for your final poster? Some of you. How many people are already in your groups and your teams? Many of you. So you should take some notes because I'm going to give you some hints on primary resource research. How she used primary sources to complete her research. 
So this is what happened. I, uh, I, I went to school, uh, actually before that, I used to work as a performing and visual arts teacher. Uh, and then I went to school, go ahead. Then I, um, I, I was in a government, uh, what is it called? An, an MPPA, so a master's in public policy, a master's degree program. And I worked and lived in Sacramento. And I learned a lot, but I really hated living there. So I ended up coming back and deciding to go to grad school somewhere else. And that's where I ended up completing my doctorate. And um, my degree is in depth psychology. So I'm going to walk you through some of the things, some of the methods that depth psychologists use in order to complete research. So depth psychology is an interdisciplinary field um, and practice, right? So it's not just research, but it touches upon many of the major, major things that you can study at PCC and beyond, right? So religious studies, indigenous studies, critical race theory, mythology, um, psychology, geology, uh, physics, all kinds of different uh, majors in the humanities and in the hard and what they call soft sciences. So my degree is a social science degree, but it um, makes you wear many hats because you have to look for information in different places. So in this third box you see it's the study of living culture, archetypes and mythology across discipline and throughout the past and possible future histories. This means that we pay attention to the present and what is happening now. So that's a little bit different than someone who studies history in the past and talks about things that happened you know, 2,000 years ago or 200 years ago and says this is how it was because all of those things are influenced by power dynamics. Who do you think gets to write the history books? If you are in uh, Australia and you are an indigenous person, are you likely to be the person that authored the textbook? Probably not, right? Usually the person who wins the battle, the person who's the victor or the person who is the top of the power dynamics, those are the people that tell the stories and assign meaning and things to other people, even if it doesn't uh, apply to them. And that's the way it works. So depth psychology helps you read between the lines. So we're going to look at some examples that are found in Dawn um, of my depth psychological research. So this is how Octavia Butler defined um, my field, right? People wonder, well, what is mythology? Oh, that's somebody else's religion. Or what is mythology? Oh, that's Greek and Roman stuff. Nope, that's my least favorite kind of mythology. It's over with and done with and um, is not as culturally relevant to me. So she wrote a book and she used Igbo uh, mythology and culture to write. The original protagonist in Dawn, like Lilith Iapo, the protagonist that you're reading about, always had an Igbo name. It wasn't Lilith. But her, her name, her middle name, and her cultural background, or, or the things that were meaningful that Octavia Butler picked, were Igbo. So it's relevant here, even though this is a different book. So at the top, you guys should write this down. Um, it says, archetype means not only the original from which copies are made or something continued, but it means the epitome or the perfect example. An archetype contains all of the possible meanings, positive and negative, across the scope of meanings that something can have. That means that it is the opposite of a stereotype. Now remember back when I said deaf psychologists uh, don't study history in a linear way? Well, um, deaf psychologists would look at the culture and the things that were happening at the time when the, the written record was made or at the oral histories passed down in culture. So an archetype is the quintessential or the most meaning-laden uh, image or object or uh, state of being that can exist. And it contains creation myths, mythology, folklore, religious practices, both things that are sacred and profane, like profanity, cursing, right? Proverbs, sayings, and the tales of heroes, and the ways that, that regular people lived. So that's important because Octavia Butler is writing contemporary cultural mythology. She's using what she observes in the 1980s when she started thinking of ideas to write the book in order to extrapolate, well, 
what would it be like if we had um, science fiction that actually had people of color that could have lines? Like, there's a joke that the person um, in the original series of Star Trek has a red shirt on, and that's the person who has no lines who always gets killed first. The people who are the principal characters, who are the main characters who have the most lines and the most things happening, those people are often not people of color and not people on the margins. So she noticed that when she was reading science fiction. She said when she started to write that she would read these uh, pulp stories and magazines that had things in them and that she wrote stories about 30-year-old men who drank and smoked too much because that's what all the stories that she was reading about were, even though as a 12, 13, 14-year-old, she certainly was not a 30-year-old white man who drank and smoked too much. But that's what she was seeing. She was not seeing herself represented in the genre. And so she says she wrote herself in. Anybody have any questions about this? I'm going to give you some examples of contemporary folklore and things that we believe as a culture that show up in the book. I showed people this slide before with only the text. And I alluded to um, Octavia Butler's filing si si um, system. So one of the things that she would do is, Listen to NPR, watch the news, read the newspaper, go to the library, look things up, uh, go to the bookstore, look on the shelf in the section of the thing that she was interested in. And then she would take in this particular envelope, the one right here, even though it's, uh, it says biomed. So this is a file for her. So she would take this manila envelope, which is about the same size as this paper, right? And she would fold up the newspaper articles, which she read, highlighted, and took notes on. And then she would file it in the envelope inside uh, this envelope and write the name of the article on the outside. And you can see the underlining is things that, were, that the article was about. So sports psychology, right brain experience, the veteran, of something about a veteran, self-help, lie detectors, and agoraphobia. So it says psychology and self-help, but those are really uh, biomedical uh, things about the history of medicine and new developments in medicine that people uh, were writing about in popular culture in like the LA Times or the New York Times or uh, something that you could pick up when you were out and about. And you'll see this is an example of what a box looks like. So this uh, envelope, and you see some newspaper in the back. This is from box 275. There are more than 350 boxes and 8,000 individual items, plus, 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 of Octavia Butler's manuscripts, newspapers, notes, and all of those things. And I say this, and I say it in public all the time. Anybody who says that they're an expert uh, and that they know the archives, there's no person that can be an expert absolutely, right? Especially more than me, because I have not read all 350 boxes and the tens of thousands of pages of things that she wrote and typed and collected, right? So it's a process. It takes a long time. You have to check out each box one at a time. Then you have to look in each folder, and then you have to figure out what's there and what it's related to. So very, research is, a, is a, a labor of love. And researching in the archives gives me an insight into Octavia Butler's process of research her unconscious thoughts, her secret desires and wishes, her methods, her intelligence, things about her growing up, and all kinds of things that I couldn't just read from a book or uh, hear secondhand from someone that knew her, or thirdhand from a fan who guesses some things about her. But I can confirm them or say, from what I understand so far, or what I've read so far, this is what I think was going on. So it's very different than saying, oh, I'm an expert and I know everything. Because this is like 40 plus years of work um, and so it's a lifetime's worth of research. And here you can see some of the files. She has one on the brain. Uh, uh, this, is the, this is out of the back file. One on handicaps. She has a, a, a catalog from the Braille Institute. There's a book that she wrote about blindness. What are some reasons to do archival research? So it's a primary source in the author's own words. You get the notes, thoughts, and research that they did from the library, the news, text, audio, video things that they did, interviews, and the original drafts of published and unpublished manuscripts. To, pre to prepare for coming to talk to you, I actually read some things that were not published that took place um, that were, um, at the time when she was about to start writing this to see which ideas she was working through. 
and she kept everything, like grocery lists, receipts, her high school yearbooks, her middle school yearbooks, her yearbooks from when she went to PCC, almost every single thing that you can think of, uh, business cards, photograph notes, class notes from elementary school, report cards from third grade, letters and cards to her mother. I mean, anything that you can think of is in there. Um, and you don't know what you're looking for sometimes. Sometimes you find things by accident. So here is a sampling of things that you can find in the archive. And I actually have, uh, uh, in the next uh, presentation, I'm going to show people more things in her handwriting. But for this time, I just want you to get a sense of the kinds of different materials that she had. And I will read you uh, some things that are kind of covered up. Now, right in the center, you see the back of this envelope. It says, um, Biomed 1, right here in the center, Biomed D, Molecular Biology, and it says Personality. So she says, here are some other things that I added into this envelope. That's the back of the envelope I showed you earlier. So she says it's psychology and self-help, but it's much, much more. So let me find what she says. And I, this is what I think. So these little, uh, these small postcards that you see with the green handwriting, those are like primary so source notes. When I learned how to research, there was a thing called a card catalog. And this like um, big set of drawers, right? And you, it was in alphabetical order and all the books in the library had a little card and you would have to look up the subject in the card, take it out, copy it down on a little postcard, then go to the library and find the book. So like I'm old enough that that's the way that you did research. Um, and I find that it's been, <laughs> It's helpful to have that background because if I didn't, I wouldn't know what I was looking at. So here is what, um, I'll tell you what it says right here about the aliens and Dawn. And I'm gonna share more of that when, um, when I do the third presentation, but I don't wanna do your work for you. I want you to make your own observations. So this is what she says, and this is key. Um, it says the Owen Kali as a controlled cancer a metastasized fragment spreading for good, immortality and regeneration, not ill. Not a wild carnivorous growth that destroys its host, but controlled growth that re-enlivens isolated species through their cells. So people are like, oh, science fiction, what is that garbage? Oh, what is that, comic books? Like this is, you know, intellectual capacity beyond uh, people that drink and smoke too much. And this is just a note that she wrote herself so that she could remember when she was writing the characters how they should behave. And I have reason to believe that the aliens were the first characters that she developed. Um, and then down here in the corner in red, this is uh, these note cards that have Xing out and different things. She, she was extremely shy. Um, and when she would give talks, she was super nervous and she would like sweat and be really anxious. So she'd practice what she was going to say and she would type it out, handwrite it, carry note cards. So what she says right here is, I am, I am an observer and a writer. That's how I function, standing outside and trying to understand and assimilate what I see. I come to understand that a few years ago, that a few years ago when a friend of mine had cancer, so cancer is like its own character, and she personifies it through the aliens. So anybody who wants to use cancer as their um, thing that they want to write about in their poster topic, anybody who's chosen that? Because I'm pretty sure we have it on the list, mm -hmm. right? So if you look at this card that says Scientific American, I'm pretty sure that that's a magazine. And she puts the information there. She says the date that the publication was, July 1984, so right before she was writing this book. Um, page 86 is where the article begins. She has the title and the subject, and it's on carcinogenesis, right? Uh, Im immunotoxins, um, and another one called the proteins of, of oncogenes, so the, the carcinogenic genes. like. You know, this is beyond like uh, Superman and Spider-Man and the things that people are writing about. It's a very rich medical, cultural history and understanding of science. So who has seen this slide before? Who can tell me something about this slide? Yes. The character from the first one changes, like they first mentioned it with the white female, like the white person, and then now 
more recently because I guess they were still a little racist stuff. <laughs> well, yes, what she said, she's referring to this lovely, sexy, redhead lady with the 80s bangs <laughs> and the Farrah Fawcett feathers, <laughs> feathered hair. Um, uh, there's no white lady with red hair that's a protagonist of the book. And people try to whitewash covers, like in 2017. So the publishing industry is still highly problematic. Um, there's a campaign, uh, hashtag, we need diverse books. And um, they're talking about disparities of who appears in books that are published and all the gatekeeping that happens with that. So that's one observation. Anything else that you... Uh, can observe looking at these different covers of the book through time. Go ahead. This from um, whitewash covers for, in order to sell the books at the beginning to just simply like the title and the image to finally a true or what we what we perceive as the true representation of the list in the cover. So. Uh, many of you probably weren't born in 1987. However, that, that's a short amount of time, right? During my lifetime in which that progression happened from a whitewash cover to simply these two uh, with the pictures are ebooks. And then the final one has um, an artist's rendering of an African American or brown skinned woman that actually does appear in the book, not the redhead lady with the Farrah Fawcett curls. So that's an interesting thing to note, that even though these things happened, uh, Octavia Butler could not, even though she had already written about seven books by the time this book was published, even she did not have the power to make them do right by her and have a cover that represented what was happening. And people tell these stories over and over and over again, and the battle is not over. Um, so it's um, good that we're reading her now and that we can talk about these things. Um, when someone finds these covers like in a used bookstore, they always post them on the internet and I laugh so hard because it's like, what is, what, what is that? <laughs> like, what is that though? And then they have the nerve to reframe it and put red letters around it and have the picture again. Just, just hot mess, just I don't, nothing else I can say about that. So we're going to turn to Dawn. Here is something that Octavia Butler wrote. And remember I said she was nervous when she had to do public speaking. How many people, let's just check in. You know you all have to do public speaking for your poster project. Everyone should have their hand up, right? Everybody knows. So here are some techniques that you can use. She typed it out in 16 point font. These things were also on her note cards. And it's really interesting. The original trilogy that was sold was called the Xenogenesis Trilogy. And we call it Lilith's Brood now, but when they first bought the trilogy, all three books, she had the idea for all three books and how they were going to go, and she was working through them. So she says in this speech called Fixing the World, um, and at the bottom of the page in the corner, right here, you can see my citation because this is all copyrighted um, things. I'm using them um, with permission from the estate. Um, she says, when I began to work on Dawn and realized that the word xenophile described them, meaning the aliens, I looked up the word in my main dictionary, a big two volume thing that came out in the early 1960s. I considered it a good dictionary and I liked using it. Actually, I liked reading it. She actually spent a whole hour looking up words on this day, she writes in her diary. Um, that's now. That's how I ran across the word xenogenesis, the supposed production of offspring wholly and permanently unlike the parents. But I did not find the word xenophile. Then she says later, I found xenophobia, xenomania, and of course down, she says in newer dictionary, she sees xenophilia, but she doesn't see xenogenesis anymore. She said, nevertheless, the search was an interesting cultural experience. I think that Octavia Butler, like me, is a critical depth psychologist. She's using primary sources and reading the cultural paradigm and information that arises in the middle of her research. She's, she understands that the way the words show up in the dictionary speak to how the culture is at the time when the dictionaries are produced. And you know we add foolishness words like selfie and 
probably like crunk and woke and things like that get added into the dictionary, the words that are in the vernacular or that are slang get added into the dictionary and the dictionary expands. But it's still a political document, right? Because who controls the entries? So we're coming to a time when I want you guys to start thinking about ways that images in Dawn show up in contemporary culture. Octavia Butler was commenting on some things that happen in culture. The first thing that she talked about in her journals of, at this time was that um, ERA was not signed. Does anybody know what ERA is? Anybody? Equal Rights Amendment. You guys have never heard of that? Did you know that there's no Equal Rights Amendment that women have the same rights as male identified folks in this country? Who knew that? You did know that. So in 1980, she's reading about and hearing about in the news that people are so upset, how dare women ask not to be treated like garbage? How dare they expect to do anything but be secretaries and wives? How dare they you know, want not to be beaten, raped, and killed because someone is in a rage? It's kind of like the um, uh, arguments that happen when people say, oh, these um, middle school girls shouldn't wear tank tops or short shorts because why? It distracts the boys. The boys have no control over their arousal responses and therefore we must tell these young women that they should act accordingly. That's called respectability po politics. Those are some of the things that Octavia Butler was aware of uh, and I'll show you a picture of her. You saw some pictures of her. She was uh, six feet tall by the time she was 12 years old. So, yeah, she had a very, yeah, she had a very, very low, low voice. She, uh, after the 1960s, she would cut her hair short in a natural. So, like, people would be like, sir, get out of the women's restroom. Or on the phone, they'd be like, Sir, can I please speak to the lady of the house so I can sell her a vacuum, you know? So she understood how masculinity was perceived, how it was feared, how people projected fear onto her, um, and how isolating it was to be someone who presented as butch, uh, like someone who was called a lesbian and a dyke and all kinds of other unsavory names just because of how she looked. She was bullied in school. Um, she names in the archives some of her bullies, interestingly. There was a big exhibit at the Huntington, and I found the names of the bullies while I was doing some research filed in a place that I, you know, you wouldn't think. And then I looked at her yearbooks. So then I went to the bookstore. There was this giant display of all of her books. It was like as big as this desk, taking up the whole thing. And one of her bullies had a book, like, in the corner facing the other way. And I was like, that's how the universe works. Octavia's taking over the whole Huntington, and this dude has one book more power to her. So anyway, these are the things that she was aware of. And the wor world that she creates asks the questions like, well, what if there was gender equality? Or what if women and people on the margins were not asked to shut up and be grateful that they make millions of dollars um, and that they shouldn't be protesting people getting gunned down in the streets? Like, so these are issues that would happen. The town where I live, Monrovia, California, I read uh, during my research, there was a 12-year-old boy, uh, an African-American boy, who was accused of shoplifting in 1975, I believe it was. And Octavia knew about this story. So the boy was picked up by the police and put in the jail for, in the city jail, for being suspected of shoplifting and allegedly hung himself. Does that sound familiar to you? What name comes to mind when we think about something like that happening? Sandra Bland. Anyway, this is not new, right? Octavia Butler said, there's nothing new under the sun, but there are new suns, and she writes about new suns. So here are some images. So these are some uh, images throughout history. So if you see the first image, the wood carving, it's of Mohini, who um, is a, a, a female manifestation of the deity Vishnu, who is, um, Mohini is 
desire personified and perfected. And that's from about the fifth century before the common era and is depicted in the Mahabharata. So this is like a, a, a feminine, uh, kind of feminine mystique that has all of this power and allure to be desirable and um, a very a powerful cultural image. Um, and you'll see this close up later. Um, but she's like, if you see her stance, she's like this. She's leaning on a cane or something, which is very phallic. She's got her leg crossed, and she's at ease in her own personhood, right? And at the top, you see Lilith. How many people knew that Lilith was a mythological figure? A few people. Can someone tell me about Lilith? Or what do you know about Lilith? Go ahead. Uh, LA. Oh, you're telling about Lilith Iapo. I'm talking about, yes, I'm talking about the Lilith here who's got the long red hair like the lady on the cover with the snake uh, over her shoulder. Does anybody know about the mythological Lilith before this? So, Lil that was good. That was a good summing up of the character in the novel. But I'm talking about why would Octavia Butler choose the name Lilith? Well, Lilith was Adam's first wife. Um, and this is, not, this is in uh, Jewish mythology and pre-existing like Babylonian, Mesopotamian, so the beginning of civilization. This character was Adam's first wife who got tired of being on the bottom and didn't want to keep having missionary sex and listening to Adam tell her what to do all the time because God said tell everyone what to do and the animals and everything are yours and she left. So Lilith is the figure that is like a, a autonomous liberated female who goes uh, where she wants to go and does what she wants to do and it said that Lilith um, has monstrous babies with demons and Lilith is an out-of-control woman. She's like the what-not-to-do woman, even though Eve is not treated very well in biblical mythology either, right? It's like nobody wants to be Eve, right? It's said that Lilith disguised uh, herself as the serpent in order to tempt Eve. That's one version of the story. So Lilith here um, in this 1892 painting by John Collier is is uh, depicted in that way, that she's enraptured with the snake and in, in comfortable with it. And the snake is a very phallic, snake kind of looks like sperm, right? It's like, it has a little head and a tail that wiggles. So it's a very phallic and potent symbol. And what's this right here? Who doesn't know who this is? That's Medusa, but who is it though? Rihanna. Who knows something about Medusa? Okay, besides Versace, the mythological significance of, shh, go ahead. She was cursed by Athena because she was found in the pocket in front of her Parthenon, but then when she was cursed, she was a Gorgon as well, into a Gorgon where she can't look at males in the eyes. Um, and if she does, they turn into stone, but females can actually so she has snakes for hair. Medusa is a mythological clue that Octavia Butler gives you in the text. She says, he was sitting there. Like, this is the thing that freaks me out the most. Like, do you remember Lilith had like this platform like that rose out of the ground in her cubicle? And that when, uh, I think it's pronounced, Chdaya comes in and says, Lilith, you must get used to me, right? And he comes and like sits here he like sits on the thing and Lilith is like forget that so she goes behind and she lays down and then he comes back and he says no Lilith here and she's like whoa you know like that's the response you have when you're reading right like grossed out I'm sure I'm not the only one and so then she says he's sitting there crouching in an unnatural way with his Medusa-like, like she's trying to relate it to something that she knows in culture. Go to the next one. So here are the, here are the complete images. So you can see that the snake is wrapped all the way around Lilith's ankle. 
You can see that there's an aroused male figure that's smaller than Mohini in the center wood carving. And then you can see uh, Rihanna. So here's some more mythology for you. Does anybody know what this is right here? Anybody know what that is? That's an Egyptian goddess that's tattooed right, right, almost, that right underneath uh, Rihanna's heart. That's probably her real tattoo. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and she, she's like a combination of Medusa, right? But she also is Lilith at the same time. And she also, in her own uh, public persona, is a liberated woman in charge of and standing in her own sexuality, right? And people are very interested in what happened when she was involved in domestic violence. That woman who wants to participate in carnival and do all of these things and not be controlled by anyone else, that that was her punishment. So I'm going to show you some more pictures of this. This is the 25th anniversary of GQ, by the way, 2003. OK, so here's where it gets a little bit weird. So here's, here's three different photos from the shoot. I want you guys to look at this one over here on the left-hand side where she has fangs. Now, we don't know um, how snake-like Medusa is, but we see multiple archetypal images that are resonating in modern and contemporary culture that relate to our book that was written in 19, that was published in 1987. Because what's going to happen? What do the Oankali want from Lilith? Anybody? To have babies, like hybrid babies. They want to mate with Lilith and have hybrid babies. And does anybody know what the human contradiction is? Can anyone tell me? Have you read that far? What are the two things that are conflicting in the uh, DNA of human beings? You should write this down and pay attention to it. It's hierarchical behavior and intelligence. It's called a human contradiction. The Oankali have read the DNA of human beings, and they decided that they blew themselves up because they tried to one-up themselves to death. And therefore, they're going to breed it out of them. And that they are, uh, they say, we are committed to the trade, Lilith. I don't <laughs> I don't know, but if somebody told me that, I'd probably be a little freaked out too. So last time, I asked people if they knew who La Llorona was. Can somebody who has not spoken yet tell me who that is and where they heard it and what the context is? How about, I mean, I heard everyone like go, uh. So who is La Llorona? First of all, what is the root of that word? What is the root? To cry, to cry. So I heard your family, um, basically like this lady, she wanted to get married to some like, man. Like he didn't want kids, so uh, she had two kids. And when I heard she drowned him in a river, he ended up not wanting to get married to her. She cries for them because she killed them. She sacrificed them in front of the life. She so there's this woman who's grieving for her children, running around looking for children, crying and wailing and screaming. And they tell you, why would they tell you that story? Like, so you wouldn't get lost. So you wouldn't wander off and do something you're not supposed to be doing. So they use a mythological character, right? So folklore and a, a something that, like Santa Claus, right? We say like, oh, Santa Claus isn't real. But did you wander off? Nope. Were you worried about the lady getting you a little bit? Yep, until you were old enough to realize that that couldn't happen, right? So La Llorona is also based on history. Um, La Malinche, right? La Malinche is um, the woman who is said to have, um, um, she's based on a, uh, the first, the mother of, of Mexicans, right? She was an indigenous woman who was the translator and guide for Cortez, the way Sacagawea was the guide and uh, translator for Lewis and Clark, right? And so she, her children were those monstrous hybrids that made Mexicans, right? Spanish and indigenous together. Um, and Malinchismo, has anybody ever heard that? Who said yeah? 
What does it mean? Can someone say what it means? What does malinchismo mean? No, you've never heard of it. So malinchismo means like um, multiple things, but it means the betrayer, the person that is Malinche, the person that sold out the Indians to the Spanish. So because Malinche, uh, Donna Maria, because she translated, probably fewer people died because there were fewer cultural misunderstandings. And even if she slept with him and had kids or was raped by him and had kids, it gave birth to another nation. But Malinchismo has to do with like a, a preference for culture outside of what is your own. Or kind of like when people say, oh, you're a sellout. That's the same thing as being like, ah, Malin Mal Malinche, right? I mean, uh, so that's a cultural archetype. That's something that appears in the culture, right? Somebody wanting to be like, oh, oh, no, um, my, my last name is this. Like, oh, I'm, I'm not actually Mexican. I'm from here, or I'm not whatever. Like, so people wanting to distance themselves from their own cultural background. Or it's like, oh, no, 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 I have an iPhone 75. I'm not poor. That's the same kind of resistance to being labeled. And so it's a very, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a scapegoat archetype. So that's what Malinche is. So everything bad that you don't want to be as a Mexican or indigenous person or a person of color is like that. It has a quality of Malinchismo, right? And so that's a, a female character that things are pushed onto. But then we have other things that end up in culture. Like the Sukuyant is a shapeshifter. She uh, takes off her skin. She leaves it somewhere, hides it somewhere, and then goes and sucks the life out of, have you, has anyone heard this before? <laughs> goes and sucks the life out of the living while they're sleeping. And then, and that's how she stays alive and gets her immortality and lives unnaturally long. And then she goes and puts her skin back. And the only way to get rid of her is to burn her skin before she puts it back on. Like these are things that come out of the culture in the Caribbean. A selkie does something similar, except that she has the bottom of like a seal, so like a mermaid, and the top half of a woman, and uh, is alluring and uh, can tempt you. Like people said that mermaids were some, you know, men would dive into the water trying to look for mermaids. And who hasn't heard of the chupacabra? Yeah, yeah something that, like, people believe that this exists and talk about it and say they're going to take pictures of it. So these are all related to the monstrous image in the book. And here are a few other general ones. So next one. So who's got questions before we end? Who has questions? Or what questions do you have about the book from what you've read so far? Yes. What was going on in the author's life while she was writing Dawn? So I explained some of this, right? Equal rights amendment, people saying that there could be a winnable nuclear war where if we dropped a nuclear bomb on Korea, for example, or Russia, that somehow the whole earth wasn't going to be polluted and they wouldn't shoot us too. She thought, that's ridiculous. And oh, by the way, do you guys see her signing copies of the redheaded lady copy of Dawn? Like, the, how, she wasn't OK with it, but what could she do? They bought the books. Like, when she sent the final script, she had to argue it out with them. Anyway. Some of you have class. You can feel free to come up with questions. 